is sending you best wishes for your happy birthday. Have a, I hope you are having a fantastic day. And this is your space and this is your time. Thank you, Lucy. Okay, thank you, JC. Um, so hopefully this works. Uh, and hopefully you can see this screen. Can everybody see primate, cha primate responses to habitat change in the Peruvian Amazon? Is everyone looking at the same screen? Hold on. Just going to get my second screen up because this isn't working. Okay. Okay, it's definitely sharing the right one. Okay. Can somebody um, unmute themselves and just confirm when I share that you can see it? Because I'm terrified that I'm going to start talking and nobody can see my screen. You cannot see my presentation screen. Thank mm -hmm. you, Steph. Right now we can see nothing. Okay, hold on. Uh, let's try. Hold on. We did practice this before, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we swear. Okay. There you are, Lucy. Right, you got me? You're almost. You're almost, you're almost done. <laughs> so the problem is, I've got. There you are. Okay, are we in? Yeah. Now, are you seeing? Are you seeing the actual presentation, or are you seeing the presentation with notes? The presentation with notes. Oh yeah, you don't want that one. That's my private screen. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my first uh, online talk. If anyone can't tell, uh, hold on. All right, now how about that? Better? Yeah, that's it. Um, probably works because I can't see any of you right now, which means I'm not in any way scared of your faces. So this is my first online talk, so please forgive any technical difficulties. Um, so thank you to Chris for inviting me to speak today. My name is Lucy Millington. I'm going to talk to you about my PhD research. Um, Quick disclaimer, um, I was supposed to be in the field right now, so I don't have any data. So this is all about um, my proposed research and what we're planning to do partially at the MLC, but also at the study sites in Peru. And I have a sore throat, so again, apologies. And I have to say um, thank you to all of my collaborators, both in Peru and the UK and my funders, without which I wouldn't be able to do this um, because this is very much a landscape scale study very difficult to do on my own. So thank you. I thought it was killing me. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the kind of context for my PhD research within the broader ecological perspective, conservation. Then I'm going to talk to you about the two projects. So I've got a landscape scale primate community ecology study across multiple sites, but also a behavioral study that takes part at MLC on its own. And then our plans for moving forward with field work once everything gets a little bit back to normal. So just a reminder, this is what I'm really interested in. So how do primates respond to habitat change in the Peruvian Amazon? And this really, it's really in the context of a very big question in ecology. So the big question is, why are some species present in some areas and some aren't? So this is just a really small sample of some of the, the really strange looking primates you might find in Central and South America. Um, there's a huge radiation in species here. And the reason for that really is in terms of geographic barriers. So things like um, rivers, mountains, altitudinal gradients. So some animals live better at high altitudes, some at low. Some is to do with food resources. So certain species rely almost entirely on certain food resources. Also competition, so you get a lot of competition between different primate species that might affect um, the possibility of one primate species existing one place or another. And then we also have that anthropogenic change. So that's when human disturbance alters a landscape. Um, so that could be through logging, mining, agriculture, and it could be through um, complete deforestation, so fragmentation of an area, 
but it also could be um, to do with losing those food resources again. So that's what defines where some species live and some don't. And why is this important in terms of primate conservation? Why are we interested? Um, so in terms of planning protected areas for primates, um, it's really important to know what a species ecological requirements are. So I just mentioned some of those barriers, but also some of the resources they need. They might need certain species of trees to survive. But also, it's really important to remember that protected areas are wonderful places, but it's not really feasible or practical to protect all areas. Uh, many species exist outside of protected areas. Many primate species exist outside of protected areas. And so it's really important to not only protect uh, primates within these areas, but also look at these human modified landscapes, areas where people and primates use together, and understand how these primates are using those spaces. So again, understanding those ecological requirements that they need to survive in those landscapes. And it's also really important for us to remember that people need these landscapes too. So a lot of local people um, rely on these forest resources, whether that be timber or other extractive resources. And so it's really important in terms of sustainable management of landscapes for us to balance primates' needs but with people's needs as well. So this brings me on to my first study. Um, so if I just draw your attention to the maps, oh, I hope you can see my mouse. Uh, so we're kind of in this region, so southeast Peru. Um, this is Manu Learning Center here. So this is obviously where Crees run. Um, and I've also got a few study sites over in the Tampapata Reserve. And the kind of questions I'm trying to answer with the study are which species live um, in different areas? Um, what kind of habitat features might uh, predict their survival in these areas? Which habitat associations predict each species? And how is their abundance related to habitat quality? Um, and this is going to take, cross, take place across multiple study sites which all are characterized by different um, forest types, different habitat types, which have been designated through different levels of human disturbance. So we've got an undisturbed forest, um, which hasn't been exposed to any hunting. We've got a Brazil nut concession, and we've got selectively logged regenerating forests at multiple sites as well. So we really want to understand which primates are in each forest type, but also which habitat factors might be associated with each primate species to enable management planning for them in future. So before I go any further, I feel like I just have to quickly define a term. So in the last slide, I talked about selectively logged regenerating forests. So I just want to be clear on what a regenerating forest is. So it's any area that's been deforested. So whether that's through natural processes, so natural disaster, for example, or through anthropogenic action. So if the humans have come in and logged or for mining or for agriculture, quite often what happens is once you've removed, so in the case of logging, once you've removed all of those valuable timber resources, people then move on. So that area is abandoned, the forest starts to regenerate. In terms of agriculture, um, once you come in and plant crops, after a few cycles, the soil becomes infertile. So again, those lands become abandoned and people move on. So the reason this is really important is that this covers a huge area globally. Something like 70% of tropical rainforests still standing are actually in some stage of regeneration. So in terms of the future of tropical forests uh, for biodiversity, but also carbon stocks, really important. Um, it's much cheaper to let a forest regenerate than it is to try and replant a new forest. Uh, it's also very difficult to replant a forest. It's very difficult to restore a forest. Um, so what we really want to do is give these forests the best chance of regenerating naturally. And when we talk about regenerating forests, um, this is a really good example. So this is part of the NLC reserve. So this was um, partially cleared and is regenerating. It's kind of characterized by a much more open canopy. So anybody who's been in a rainforest knows that it's usually quite a dense canopy. It's quite dark. Um, you get a lot of big trees. You do get the smaller trees. You have some vegetation on the ground. But the reason there's so much vegetation on the ground in this image is because these are all new pioneer species. And they're really taking advantage of that new light gap that's been created by deforestation. And it's also really important to note that regeneration 
distribution really varies between forests. So it varies based on disturbance level. So for example, if you were to deforest an area to be used for pasture, so for cattle ranching, for example, um, quite often that doesn't regenerate very well. The reason for that is, is twofold, really. So by clearing for pasture, you tend to erode the seed bank. Um, so there are no seeds left to regenerate naturally. We've also reduced um, any chance of seed dispersers coming through. So in this case, we monkeys, spider monkeys, tapirs, all really important seed dispersers for um, tropical regeneration of forest in this area. And if you've got pasture, um, you're not going to have any of those animals to regenerate. On the flip side, in places that are selectively logged, for example, if you've still got remaining tracts of forest and you haven't hunted out those seed dispersers, um, you've got a good chance of regeneration, which is what we're seeing here at the Manly Learning Centre. Um, so those are the really important, important factors to consider with regenerating forests. They're very different. So when I said 70% of uh, remaining forests are regenerating, they could be in very different stages of succession. So back to the question. Um, so before we can really understand how primates are responding to habitat change, habitat loss, um, we need to understand a few things. So firstly, we need to start with those habitats. So as I showed you earlier with the map, we've got multiple study sites across the Madre de Dios region. And within that, we've got multiple sites, we've got multiple forest types within them. So it's not enough to say this area was selectively logged, this area is a Brazil nut concession. We need to really classify, kind of quantify that habitat quality. So we need to look at forest structure and features of the forest within vegetation plots in each study site. So we're going to be looking at things like uh, canopy connectivity, so how close is the canopy, canopy height, uh, which plant species there are in each area. And we're also going to look at food availability. So most of the primates in this region tend to, they're not all strict frugivores, but they do rely on fruit at some point during the year. So fruit's a really good way of monitoring food availability in these different habitat types. And a couple of things to note, um, Central and South American species of primate are completely arboreal. So whilst you may see some capuchins or squirrel monkeys running around the ground in the rainforest, um, they are arboreal, so we really do need to keep these forests in place for conservation. And in terms of that fruit availability, um, some of the species are very strict frugivores. So the woolly monkeys and spider monkeys, both of which are important seed dispersers, do rely on, entirely on fruit. Um, so it's really important to understand habitat quality in terms of food resources and structural um, support for these primates. And just to kind of drive this home a little bit, I've got some cute videos of woolly monkeys um, just to show you. So these guys grow up to like nine kilograms. They're very large. Um, they're quite clumsy and they really do need quite strong branches to be able to survive in a forest. Hopefully this video will work. My apologies if it doesn't. Sorry for the ter terrible camera work. And this guy as well. <clears throat> so as you can see, woolly monkeys are very large. They were both large males. Um, they do require quite large forests to survive. Um, and also they're not quite as graceful as their spider monkey cousins. So, how do we conduct these primate surveys? So we have primate transects, so we have basically have lines through the forest um, across different study sites. We have multiple different lines, different trails. We walk them at the same speed, we walk them at the same time of day, and we survey them multiple times during the field season. And when we're walking along these transects, we record which primate species we find, the number of individuals, um, the height that we find them at, and what they're doing when we encounter them. We also record location data so we can map where they are. And we do this both in the wet and the dry season to compensate for any differences in um, home range use across those times. And the kind of overarching aim of this really is to work out which species are present in each forest type 
and then also to get an idea of population density across different regions as well. How are we going to use this data? So we've got the primate community data, so that's our location data. We've got the habitat quality data, so that's our forest structure, canopy height, connectivity, plant diversity. And then we plug that in and get a nice species distribution model at the end. Once again, disclaimer, this is not my data, <laughs> but this is just a really good example of how we're going to use data. So we've got those lovely location maps, uh, location points on the map of North America at the top. And then we've got the environmental data layers. So that's different layers representing different factors, um, different variables. So things like cl climate things. So we've got, <coughs> sorry. So we've got um, temperature, rainfall, for example, but we've also got that habitat quality in there as well. Well, plug that in the logic model, and then we get a really nice heat map at the end, um, not of North America, but of Peru. Um, and each color of the map will represent how likely it is that that primate species um, will occur in that region, depending on these environmental predictors. So on to my second study. Um, so this is my behavioural study, which takes part at, takes place at the Manu Learning Centre. So quickly, I just want to talk to you about conservation behaviour. Um, so if you want to do conservation management planning for any animal, um, it's really important to understand their, their ecology, their behavioural ecology. Um, obviously, we need to know what they eat. Um, where are those resources? Are there any resources that are disproportionately important to them? So keystone resources. In terms of spatial data, um, we need to understand home range size. So if we were going to plan a protected area for spider monkeys, for example, they have very large home ranges. And you want that area to contain enough space for multiple groups of species, groups of spider monkeys, um, to live side by side and also to disperse within each group. How do we do this? So we follow monkeys every day, um, we record their behavior, so what they're eating, when they're resting, if they're socializing, traveling, etc. Um, in the end, we get something a little bit more complicated than this, but this is a good way of representing it. So basically, we get an idea of how they're allocating their time throughout the day, throughout the seasons as well, and throughout different forest habitats, um, which we can then correlate with those different habitat um, classifications, different quality. So I do want to quickly talk about why I chose Manu Learning Centre. Um, Manu Learning Centre is actually a really uh, important place to study woolly monkeys and spider monkeys in a regenerating forest. The reason for this um, is because of where it is. So hopefully you can see it on the map. Um, this is Manu Learning Center down here, and then we've got the buffer zone, and then we've got Manu National Park up here. Manu National Park is a biodiversity hotspot, very important place, very high levels of, of biodiversity. Um, in terms of that regenerating forest habitat that I talked about before, quite often what happens when people um, come in to disturb these forests is that following timber timber extraction, following agriculture, sometimes they become further degraded as time goes on instead of regenerating well. Um, quite often hunting occurs, which means we lose those seed dispersers, which means it doesn't regenerate well. You also end up with um, fragmentation. Uh, fragmentation occurs when you uh, deforest the landscape. So that picture you saw earlier with the road through it, those are two different fragments. One of them is not forested anymore but quite often you get different fragments. And if you've got an arboreal primate species that needs forest to survive, it cannot move between two fragments if there's no forest in the middle. What's really special about Manu Learning Center is that it doesn't have any of these problems. So there's no hunting, um, so there's no danger of losing the study species. There's no fragmentation, so primates are still moving within that continuous landscape and we still have those seed dispersers. So it's regenerating really well. So this is a really good opportunity to study these species here. Um, why are we studying woolly monkeys and spider monkeys? So as I mentioned earlier, they're both really important seed dispersers. So we really want to retain them in regenerating forests. So to understand how they use regenerating forests is really important to ensure that we can keep them in other regenerating forests through management planning in the future. Woolly monkeys and spider monkeys, I also mentioned, are both highly frugivorous, so they're very um, reliant on fruit. 
The thing about fruit resources is that fruit is really quite a patchy resource. So you tend to get it's quite clumped and patchy, which makes it difficult anyway. Um, and then if you add into that habitat loss or habitat change, quite often if you think about logging, if you're removing um, timber species, you're probably removing fruit trees as well. And so that makes these species really sensitive to habitat change. As I mentioned with hunting, you often get hunting in, in areas of anthropogenic modified landscapes. Woolly monkeys and spider monkeys are unfortunately targeted um, quite strongly for hunting. Woolly monkeys especially, um, they're large, as you saw, they're loud, they're in big groups, um, they're quite easy to hunt. So not only do we lose them, so we can't study them in these landscapes, but it's also not ethical to study them in a landscape where they're hunted because obviously that increases the danger to them. Another really interesting thing um, about woolies and spiders is that they occupy very similar ecological niches. So they're both large, they both eat fruit, um, they both require relatively large spaces, which means that they don't occur across their range together. So spider monkeys occur all the way down from Central America through South America. Woolly monkeys have a much more patchy distribution through South America, so certain parts of the Amazon, including here. So it's really interesting, um, just from a research point of view, to study these two species together to try and understand how they coexist, how they share resources. But to be able to study them in a regenerating forest where we are assuming that there's less fruit available, so less food available, it's really a, a unique opportunity to study them and to try and understand how they coexist. And the research question around this really is, is how are the woolly monkeys and spider monkeys partitioning their resources to reduce competition? So are they competing for resources? Are they in large trees fighting? Um, or are they dividing up? So during times of fruit scarcity, often um, primate species will feed on different resources. They usually have lower quality. Woolly monkeys tend to eat uh, invertebrate prey, so arthropods, whereas spider monkeys tend to go for leaves and flowers. So are they maybe diverging more of their niche than usual um, as a result of this lower habitat quality? Or is there more competition? Or are they traveling further to get more food? These are the kind of questions I really want to answer by studying these guys at NLC. So by the end of this, um, when I eventually get to the field, um, we're really hoping to have some primate community data. So we want to have those population densities showing us how, much, how many primate species are living in an area, but also how many primates of each species live in each area, locations for them, the animal behavior for woolly monkeys and spider monkeys. So how are they using regenerating forest landscapes? Um, that habitat quality data. So how these different areas that are characterized by different levels of disturbance are structurally different to each other and how that is affecting um, fruit resource availability. And then we're going to create those species distribution models to predict distribution across a wider region, um, which would be useful for cons conservation management planning. So yeah, habitat plus distribution plus behavior equals management planning. So hopefully um, we'll be able to go out to the field soonish. Um, we'll do our primate and habitat surveys across multiple study sites. We'll do them in the wet season and the dry season so we can see how they may change across those seasons. We're going to do the behavioral study at the MLC for woolly monkeys and spider monkeys. And I just want to thank uh, all my field assistants for their patience right now. I know some of you are watching. Um, I can't wait to work with you guys. Uh, it's going to be great when we finally get there. And I do have just a random pic video of all the monkeys because why not? Yeah. Any questions? Just realized I had that thing on the whole time and I didn't need to have it. Thank you, Lucy. Let's see. <laughs> we are going to see the questions and I'm going to read them for you. <laughs> Nothing too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to choose the easiest one. <laughs> Look, the first one. To what point is important to know ecological requirements of a population that survives in 
in anthropic, anthropic areas if this population could be under an extinction process. Hold on. Can you read that one again? Sorry, you, yeah. you, 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 you. I'm going to read it. Right. <laughs> to what point it is important to know ecological requirements of a population that survives in anthropic areas if this population could be under an extinction process? Okay, so why is it important to understand the ecological requirements of a species in an anthropogenic environment if it's under an extinction process or if it's kind of in danger of extinction? Is that the question? Whoever's question that was, let me know if I'm not answering it. Um, so intrinsically, um, it's important to understand the ecological requirements of uh, all species, any species, especially those that need to be managed in a conservation kind of realm. In terms of anthropogenic landscapes, um, I do realize that some primate species will survive in some areas and some won't especially with or without um, human interference from conservation management. Um, in terms of extinction, surely it's really important to study primates <laughs> and to study how they survive in an anthropogenic landscape if they are in danger of extinction. Um, and even if you were in danger of losing a population, um, a decision has to be made whether you're going to employ extreme measures to protect it. So for example, with mountain gorillas, we have extreme conservation where, you know, you have veterinary um, medical teams, so the gorilla doctors, who actually interfere and treat any gorilla, any mountain gorilla that gets sick. That's really extreme conservation, um, but it's worked. The mountain gorilla has bounced back from critically endangered to endangered. So you can do that, but the other way of doing it, um, if you weren't going to employ those kind of extreme measures, is that you could learn from that, that population that perhaps are going to go extinct. You can learn from them while they're still there, and then you can use that data to inform management plans elsewhere um, so that other species or other, in other areas don't suffer the same fate. Because sometimes we can't fix it, um, sadly. But we can always learn from our mistakes. Um, we can always learn from what we've, uh, yeah, what we've done wrong. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. can see Mark questions popping up. Yeah, Lucy, sorry, I have my microphone on. <laughs> I'm going to raise it now. Mark Thomas asks you, are the emoji primates become accustomed to humans? Yeah. So he's playing lots of volunteers and research stuff. How, how could this change their behavior and how can you take that into consideration when extracting on a larger, larger scale? Okay, so habituation of primates to people in the MLC is actually a really good thing. So one of the reasons that I'm able to do a behavioral study um, at the MLC for my PhD research is because they're already semi-habituated to people. So it's actually very hard to habituate animals to people, especially some of those larger bodied primates. It takes a long time. Um, initially, you have to scare them by, by accident. Um, you can stress them out. It can be quite um, detrimental to their health initially. You have to decide if it's worth the risk of doing that. But because at the MLC, the primates are so used to volunteers and research staff, it actually means they don't tend to react to us. So I think there's still a little bit of reaction from some of the smaller species because they haven't been followed. Um, but the woolies and the spiders, as far as I know, are nearly ready to follow and record data. So there's still a little bit more habituation. So once we get there, eventually, um, we, do, we do need to finish habituation. So we need to get to a point where they're no longer reacting to us. So where they're no longer interested in us, um, they're no longer threat displaying at us because that does affect their behavior, obviously. Um, when I was there last for my pilot study, one of the groups of woolly monkeys was quite habituated, but a lot of the youngsters were kind of hanging down and, and kind of staring at us. Um, and as cute as that is, um, obviously that's not the behavior we're trying to capture. So in terms of habituation, you need to fully habituate before you can take behavioral data. Um, but the habituation that's already happened at the MLC is actually really helpful for me. So I'm very grateful for everybody who goes out there and um, makes the monkeys used to people. <laughs> Uh, 
Thank ah. you. So we have a new question. Johanna asks you, there is methods or techniques to study the behavior of non-habituated primates. If, is it is possible? Um, I mean, it depends on what you want to record. In theory, yes, you could record. Um, so some studies um, actually record data during the habituation process so that they can re record the point when the monkeys stop reacting. So you could record from the moment you start finding those monkeys when they, they might run away from you or they may threat display at you. They may move higher up in the trees. So you could definitely record them in the same way. You would find it much harder um, because they're probably going to run away. Um, but you definitely could record it, but it depends what your question is. So if you want to know how they behave naturally, obviously that's not going to work. You're not going to get natural behavior. You're going to get reaction. Um, but yes, you can do it, but it is hard. Um, and it's very hard to habituate primates anyway, um, especially primates that are used to hunting um, or any kind of any other um, reactions from humans. Great. Thank you, Lucy, again. Now, Pierre is asking uh, you, at what point do you consider a regenerating forest to be regenerated after being completely destroyed or selectively lodged? Oof, that's hard. Um, so, it really depends. Um, I think, I think, Pierre, I recognize that name. I think Pierre's been to the NLC and has actually seen the forest. So I'll, I'll put it in that context. So to somebody who's not been to a rainforest before and they walk around the MLC reserve, um, a lot of it will look like pure virgin rainforest. Um, you know, big trees, thick canopy. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's structurally the same as the old growth forest that used to exist there. Um, the other areas of the MLC, so down the, the very cleared area, um, that's very obviously still regenerating. I don't know at what point I would say that the forest is completely regenerated. Um, I'd have to really think about what I was looking for. I would probably have to have a, a bunch of measures, so a canopy height, um, canopy connectivity, certain species that are more late successional. So for example, I spoke about those um, very thick vegetation uh, in, the, in the light gap. Those are pioneer species. So we know from tropical forest research that late successional species look very different to pioneer species. So I think there are certain species that we would look for um, in that regenerating forest to be able to indicate that it's at least at a later stage of regeneration. Um, in terms of it replicating the original forest. I'm not sure it ever would. Um, it really depends on those seed dispersers, but it depends on a lot of things. Um, it's very hard to know. And there's also an argument that what we consider old growth forest actually isn't a primary forest either, because there's been, you know, through history, there's been lots of people who've settled in the Amazon. Um, so it's really hard to kind of classify what an old growth forest is. But I would definitely be looking at certain measures of um, yeah, height, connectivity, and certain species being present. But that's a really tough question. <laughs> I hope I answered it. Well, we have two, two high questions. One from JC. He said, why the small species of monkeys are not present at the jungle in, in regeneration, or they are? OK, say it again. Sorry, missed it. <laughs> Okay, why the small species of monkeys are not present at the jungle in regeneration, or they are? So, thinking about the smaller species, um, smaller species actually tend to do better in the in the Amazon anyway. Um, so, if you think about again at the MLC, you think about that area which was completely cleared. You tend to see a lot of capuchins, a lot of squirrel monkeys, a lot of tamarins. You don't tend to see the larger body species, the woolies and the spiders. Um, obviously, that's not always true, but for the most part, the reason is to do with forest structure. So again, the woolly monkeys are huge, spider monkeys are huge. Um, they need large trees to move around, but also those food resources. So you get 
less fruit available in those regenerating forests, the, the forests that are still very young compared to the older forest. And another reason it's to do with diet is that the smaller bodied species tend to rely on um, insects. So they tend to eat more insects. Uh, the capuchins can eat um, palm nuts, for example. The woolies and the spiders can't eat. And then the, the marmosets, which we don't have at MLC, but in other areas, they rely on gum. And those, those resources tend to be found in those earlier successional forests. Whereas the larger species um, relying on fruit and relying on larger branches, for example, we don't tend to find them as often in those forests. I hope that answered your question, JC. Thank you, Lucy. Jasmine Matos asked you, during your study, do you observe hostile behavior between the two groups of monkeys, perhaps a tribute to the defense of resources or territory? So, kind of. Um, so again, we've been really lucky when I was there for my pilot study, um, we saw the woolly monkeys and the spider monkeys um, hanging out in the same fig tree area. Um, it was less openly hostile um, and it was more that the woolly monkeys displaced the spider monkeys. So the woolly monkeys are in a much bigger group, so I think there's probably about 13 of them. Whereas the spider monkeys, um, they, they hang out in much smaller groups. So you have two or three of them. And they were just kind of hanging around, waiting for the woolly monkeys to come out of the tree. So although it wasn't openly hostile, um, there definitely is competition going there. And the spider monkeys um, are kind of hedging their bets, probably not fighting with a big group of woolly monkeys because it's not worth it. But there's lots of figs in the tree, so it is worth waiting for. Cool. So another one hide question is from Araceli. She said, what are the sister group of species and how do they complete? Okay, can you repeat that one? Sorry. Great. What are the sister group of the species of the species and how do they complete compete between them? Um so do you mean at MLC? Yeah. She doesn't so, but I, I guess it gets. Okay, so the sister species at MLC, so the ones we're studying in terms of the behavior, so that's the woolly monkeys and the spider monkeys. They're also closely related to howler monkeys, which are at MLC. They also have another sister species, which is a uh, Brachitelles, which lives uh, in Brazil. So we won't talk about them. Um, they do compete for resources, so they do eat fruit. Howlers uh, tend to eat more leaves. Um, at the MLC, we don't see the howler monkeys very often. I know a lot of volunteers here have seen them. I have yet to see them, having been there twice. <laughs> um, they definitely do compete for resources. Um, the question really at the MLC is, is the habitat quality good enough, even though it's a regenerating forest, for them to not be out competing each other? Um, and then the other species, so we have um, two species of capuchin monkey, we have squirrel monkeys, and we have saddleback tamarins and titis. They tend to have very different niches. Um, so in terms of where they hang out in the canopy, so for example, um, titi monkeys are kind of mid-level, squirrel monkeys are mid-level, capuchins are the same. And then you've got the larger species up in the upper canopy. So the way that they reduce competition because competition is very costly uh, in terms of energy and also danger. You don't want to um, compete with another species and get in a fight. Um, the way that they do that is by diverging their, their niches, so diverging their feeding strategies. So for example, during times of fruit scarcity, the larger capuchins, so the brown capuchins, can open palm nuts um, because they have very, very sharp, large teeth. The smaller, smaller capuchin monkeys, um, they're not able to eat those palm nuts, but they tend to go for a different food. Squirrel monkeys tend to go for invertebrates again. And then you've got the tamarins, which at certain points of the year eat pretty much exclusively one type of flower. Um, and by eating different things and existing in different parts of the canopy, they can kind of avoid competition. Um, and one of the big questions in regenerating forests is, 
is there increased competition because there's a lack of these niches, a lack of these resources for them to divide amongst you know, a huge community with maybe eight species of primates in it? Great, thank you. So one question from me. What was your most exciting experience in MLC during your field work in the past and what do you expect now in your new coming visit? Okay. Um, so during my master's work, I was there in 2013 following woolly monkeys and it was one of the days when we didn't find woolly monkeys, which happens more than I'd like to admit. Um, and we were with a group of capuchins and squirrel monkeys and it was over on T4 up that big hill, up the big rocks. And I saw a, a big hawk, I'm not sure if it was a hawk or an eagle, eagle I think, um, flew down and went for one of the squirrel monkeys. Now, it didn't get the squirrel monkey, which is why this was a happy memory. Um, as much as I appreciate that predator-prey interactions are important, I don't think it would have been a nice, a nice thing to see. Um, but it's really unusual to see predation events on monkeys. Um, it, it's quite quite rare to see. So it was very cool to see an eagle trying and failing to get a squirrel monkey. Um, and what do I expect from my field season? Hopefully lots of monkeys <laughs> and um, lots of data. I just really cannot wait to get back to the field um, and follow woolly monkeys and spider monkeys all day. Uh, waited a while to get back there. So I'm really excited. Great, Lucy. We are excited too to have you again in MLT. So one la one last question that somebody sent me by WhatsApp is: the male howler monkeys can change its behavior where the humans are present. Yes. So I actually just read a paper about this. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. So I'll be honest with you. Um, I don't know too much about this one. But in terms of primates in general, yes, they do react to people. Um, they can change their behavior a lot. So I suspect that one of the reasons we don't see how the monkeys very often at the field site might be because of having a lot of people around. It also might be reduced, reduced competition. So if there's less groups of, of howlers then there might be less reason for them to call, so there's less of a chance of us hearing them, so we think they're not there when they're actually there. Um, but yeah, they definitely can change their behavior. They can become more cryptic, so harder to spot, which might, again, be another reason why we don't see them. Anybody who's watched Howler Monkeys for any time um, knows that once they've stopped howling and once they've stopped moving, um, they're really difficult to find because even though they're bright red and you might think they'd be easy to see, they just sit still for hours and hours on end. Um, so they definitely could behave um, in a way that's more cryptic as a response to human um, disturbance. But I don't know about our howlers because I've never seen them. Great, thank you. So we have more questions. I thought I thought I thought it was the last, but okay. well, like you. So, Johanna <laughs> asks you, what do you think is more helpful for management and conservation of critically endangered species? Information of habitat requirements at site-specific scale or at a landscape scale? Okay, that is a really hard, really big question. <laughs> um, so, the problem, the problem really is that landscape scale is, is important, but site-specific scale is important too. So most of the studies that we conduct on, um, on primate ecology, primate behavioral ecology, or land, any kind of habitat study, it's done at a site-specific scale because it costs a lot of time and a lot of money to do multiple sites. I'm very, very lucky that I can do a few sites because I have funding for it, but it's really difficult. So in order to get that landscape scale, and by landscape I mean really wide regions, so multiple study sites across multiple regions you know, within a country, for example, it's really hard to get that kind of work together. It's hard to form those collaborations. You need lots of people studying at the same time and then collaborating together to join that data up. So it's really hard to even get that scale. Site-specific stuff is usually what we have um, to deal with. 
I would argue landscape scale is probably more helpful long term. Um, it depends what you're trying to protect. Um, obviously, so for example, the, the yellow-tailed woolly monkey, um, which lives in the north of Peru, that lives in quite a small area. So landscape scale for them is actually quite a small area compared to you know the, the common woolly monkey, which exists throughout uh, Amazonia. So it's really difficult. Um, I don't know is the answer. Um, I think both is really helpful uh, in terms of management planning, Site-specific stuff is very helpful, but then you have a lot of factors um, which will be site-specific, which then will not extrapolate well to landscape scale. So I think multiple sites to get landscape scale data is really helpful. But again, we're all, this is conservation, you know, we're all limited by time and money, and I think we just need to do what we can um, to try and drive conservation management forward with primate conservation. Thank you, Luigi. Well, another one. Isabel asked you, during the habituation process, do you think it's better to follow them persistently or give them space so they don't scare easily? Both. <laughs> um, so, yeah, unfortunately, if you give them too much space, then they may not habituate. So it really depends on, again, it depends on the species. So to give you some idea, with primate species, something like a TT monkey um, probably habituates very quickly within a couple of months. There are some species in Africa, so some species of baboon, um, it can take up to two years to habituate them to people. Um, in terms of having gaps, they're supposed to get used to your presence. Um, so if you were to visit them for a week and then take a week off and then have another week, actually that's going to add to the stress more over time because you're not letting them get used to you you're just stressing them out leaving them alone stressing them out instead of stressing them out there's, there's a graph so you should as, as a habituation goes forward the amount of stress they experience should go down should decrease um so although it is difficult and it's not ideal it does have to be done um, so actually, you do have to habitu habituate over a continuous period. Um, but by the same token, that doesn't mean chasing them through the forest. Um, you know, if they start fleeing, um, then yes, you, you might give up for the day and then come back the next day. But you don't want to take long periods of time as breaks with ruin habituation. Okay, Lucy, thank you. I missed one question. I realize now. So Jasmine asks you, during your study, do you observe hostile behavior between the two groups of monkeys, perhaps attributed to the defense of resources or territory? I did answer that one. Yeah? No, <laughs> well, somebody confused me yeah, here inside by what I've, I was really <laughs> trying to, to not meet nobody, so bad, bad of me. Sorry, Lucy. Well, can I just address, address that comment by Isabel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Isabel, get, get in touch with me. Um, I'd really like to talk to you about that. Because from what I understand, where I've worked with people who study TT monkeys, they find it quite easy, but that wasn't in a regenerating forest. So actually, yeah, email me. I'd be really interested to talk to you about that. Great. So Lucy, Thank you very much. I, I think we have uh, many doubts solved now. You make a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with, you, with us this time, your knowledge. So we are going to be, we are, going, we, we are happy to, to see you by this platform. And we are going to be happy to see you again in MLC soon. So, Thank you very much. Again, <laughs> we are going to we, we we are happy to have all you here. We are going to follow this uh, these lectures. So during the next weekend, we are going to schedule one again. We are going to publish our, in our social media our new 
new lecturers. So uh, please keep in touch with us, follow our social media, and we are going to be just there to, to let you know how and when we are going to restart the activities in MLC. During this time, we are going to uh, follow publishing uh, our efforts to share with all you, with you all, our activities. We are publishing our experience from the team in Voices of Manu. This is a, we are publishing a short, vid short videos on Thursdays where our staff talk a little bit about their experiences. And during the week, we are to also trying to share with you all many experiences that we have in MLC. For now, that's everything today. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much again. It was a pleasure. Bye. Everybody, stay safe. Um, well, it was a pleasure to have you here. Nice to see you, to all of you, to read you. It was a great time. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Bye. Bye.